Hi, my name is Judy Coles, and I welcome you to the, the um, Thursday evening Devo in the book of Philippians. Did you watch Pastor Larry last evening uh, with the TGP uh, New Testament survey, study of Philippians? It was great. I hope you go back and you will watch it if you haven't. If you watched it once, I hope you'll go back and watch it again. He brought out some amazing things, amazing points. One of the things that he mentioned was that the, the theme of the book of Philippians is living the Christian life. And I'm hoping that as I go through the devotional that I have chosen, <clears throat> that we'll find how that applies. After listening to Pastor Larry last night, I listened to a TV news program that I enjoy. On that news program, there was a segment about safety of all things. And uh, the speaker, Mike Rowe, was talking about safety first. And uh, if you forget to put safety first, you'll end up with some type of accident or mishap. My words, not his. <clears throat> so you always need to be careful, correct? Yes. All right. Well, he actually had a different reason for speaking about safety first, but we won't go there. I then turned off the TV and got back to reading Philippians again and was surprised that in chapter 3, the first verse says that uh, the things that were written in the book of Philippians are to safeguard us. Hmm, safety. So I put on my thinking cap and I thought, well, if things in Philippians are written as a safeguard, then we'd better obey it, hadn't we? So as a proof, perhaps only in my life, proof of obedience, I have to apply scripture to my life. My life has to be changed because of what I've read, what I've, what I've applied in my life. Philippians over the years has changed my life more than any other book in God's word. There is so much in the book of Philippians. It's almost like Proverbs. As I read it, I have to do something about it. For example, Spencer on Tuesday spoke about a lot about joy. Philippians is full of joy. If you're ever having a discouraging day, go back and get your emotional or spiritual tank refilled with joy and peace. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then Pastor Larry, in speaking last evening, toward the end of the session, gave five takeaways, one of which was a key concept of mind over circumstances. He said, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, were the triple, T-H-R-P-L-E, misspelled, God filter, which gives us a list of qualities on which to think, to meditate in order to have peace. Paul seems to say over and over in the book that he is our example. In the verses just mentioned, that uh, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, um, he gives us a list of things to think on so that we can have peace. And Paul was our example of how to have peace. He said to practice the things that we have heard, received, and learned from him, things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise, and the God of peace will be with you with me, with us. So Paul is our example in so many of the truths that he teaches us in Philippians. But the greatest example in the book is Jesus. And it's a perfect time of year to be reading about it, isn't it? Advent, the coming of Jesus to be with us, among us. Paul says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, 
make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And then it goes on to teach us to be in unity, to consider each other as more important than ourselves. So, that car that wants to pull in front of you, let him. The person who comes up to take the parking spot that you've been sitting, waiting, and aiming for, let them take it. Let the person cut in front of you at the grocery store. Don't look out only for your own personal interests, but the interests of the other person. Put them first. Then Paul tells us that Jesus is our greatest example and we need to follow his example. He is God. It says we did not re he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and was being made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That example of Jesus hit me right between the eyes and changed my life several years ago when I was very young in the faith. Sunday, for some reason, had typically been a stressful t morning in our home. We only had two kids. Can you imagine? Well, can I imagine what it would have been like if I had five? Anyhow, for some reason, we had had um, a disruption, let's call it, in, the, in our home. Well, after we dropped the kids off at Sunday school and then they went on to, to children's church, Bob and I walked into church and sat in our customary spot. At that point in my walk with Christ, I had not yet learned not to carry grudges. I was a big grudge holder. I walked in fuming about this disruption that happened at home. And I held on to that. I sat down, it seemed about three feet away from Bob and my spirit was just grumbling. Well, I opened my Bible to read. Church hadn't started yet. So I opened my Bible to read, I guess maybe to get my mind and heart ready. Well, I opened to Philippians chapter two, and I read those verses about unity, being of the same mind and the same love with humility of mind to regard one another as more important than yourself. I read about Jesus, who was God himself, coming to earth, humbling himself by being obedient to the point of death on the cross. He died on that cross for me, for my anger. I felt as if Jesus was saying to me, if I am willing to give up my equality with God, if I'm not holding on to that, if I am willing to become a bond servant, just like you, Judy Coles, can't you set aside your anger and apologize for your part in that argument that has you so worked up? Well, there was a little more to it, to what Jesus seemed to be saying to me. But the result was it caused me to slide close to Bob, link my arm in his, and to whisper, I'm sorry. The crust of anger was gone. The unity was restored. It returned, and I was changed. I learned from that to be humble, to put the other person first, to consider them more highly than myself. I also learned at that time, and every time, that I read God word that it applies to me. I must obey it and I must be changed by it. If God is going to fix our society, it has to start with me being changed by God's word. After all, following Paul's example in verse, chapter 2 verses 12 and 13, it says, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will 
and to work for his good pleasure. There's much more in verses 14 and onward, but I hope you get the idea. God is at work in you. So follow the examples that Paul has given us. Apply God's word to your life and to your heart. Obey it and be willing to be changed, to be transformed, to become more like Christ. There is so much more in Philippians that honestly, I hope you will read it and reread it and reread it again and be transformed by it. And then I pray that you will also get involved with the um, survey of the New Testament. It's been wonderful so far, and I hope you, you get as much out of it, more out of it than I have. So thank you, Jesus, for your example. Thank you, Paul, for your example. And let us be an example for each other while we pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for, for this book of Philippians, for the whole of your word, that it's supposed to, no, it's not supposed to, it will change us. It will transform us. It will make us more like Christ as we are willing to humble ourselves and to be obedient and to follow the examples of those who have gone before us, <clears throat> who have also walked in your word and followed the example of Jesus himself. I pray, Father God, for our body of believers here at TGP, at North Syracuse Baptist Church. I pray, Father God, that you will keep us all safe and healthy. I pray that we would not be fearful of this pandemic. I pray that, that we would um, rejoice and then rejoice again, knowing that you're near us, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you had this all in your hand and knew that it was coming even before creation happened. I thank you, Father God, that uh, we can rely on you, that you have our life in your hands, no matter what we're going through, no matter what our circumstances are, that you are still in control. You've not dropped us. You've not given us up. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and wisdom and a sound mind. I pray that you'll help each one of us to focus on you to get through this difficult time. Because after all, you put us here for such a time as this. Help us to take advantage of this time. I pray that you'll help us to become an example for our children, for our grandchildren, for those who are following behind us. I pray that you'll help us to be an example for our neighbors who don't know Jesus yet. I pray that you'll help us to be an influence for you, Father God so that your kingdom will expand and grow and that uh, we will continue to be a lighthouse for people seeking for your truth and maybe even not realize they're seeking for your truth. But I pray, Father God, for those in our, in our body of believers who have been, have been going through a difficult time. I pray, Father, that you would lift them up, that you would hold their spirit in your hand, which I know that you have. I know you've been collecting the tears that they've cried. And I just ask, Father God, that you will give them comfort and peace and wisdom and a plan for what you would have them do now. I pray, Father, for all the boys and girls who are going to school, who are going through a difficult time because of it. I pray, Father God, that... that um, you would remind them of songs that they've learned here at church, of Bible verses they've learned, of stories of great Bible heroes that they can follow as an example. And I pray, Father God, that uh, we will continue to walk in your way, that we will trust you and be obedient to you, and that we will come out of this pandemic shining like gold because we knew that you had us and you were leading us. I pray, Father God, that uh, we would continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your precious and holy name, Jesus, amen.